So I thought um, before I dive just straight in, I, I just wanted to just remind us of where we're up to on our journey. And um, right at the beginning uh, of this whole series, Alan just gave us a brief outline of Mark's gospel on how we were going to work our way through it. And the, the first little bit was, was, was the introduction of, in the first half of chapter one. And then from, from chapter one through to the beginning of chapter three, um, there's this whole series of, of things where the kingdom of God is announced by Jesus. And then we move from, from chapter 3 ch- uh, right the way through to uh, part way through chapter 8, where we've got the, the ministry of Jesus where he's uh, engaging with the crowds, the disciples and the opponents, these different groups of people. And then from chapter 8 to chapter 10, it tends to narrow down and is much more about the disciples and the discipleship journey, which all comes to a climax, chapters 10 to 15, um, in the the betrayal, the the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus, that last week of Jesus' life, which we often refer to as Passion Week, and then the closing summary in chapter 16. So here we are, chapter 6, we're in the middle of the section on this general ministry where Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God and, he's, and we're seeing Jesus interacting with these different groups of people um, uh, as he talks his word, as, he's, as, he, as we're reading our way through the chapter. Uh, in chapter 6, we have um, five, six little sections, really, um, which is really challenging because I wanted to do six sermons. And I thought to myself, three hours, no, that's not going to work. Um, so I'm going to have to be really, really brief on each of these six sections. So five of them, um, we continue to see Jesus teaching and demonstrating the kingdom of God. And there's one little section, not so little section actually, but one section which is, which is almost like a diversion, where Jesus gets, uh, and Mark gets diverted to talking about the death of John the Baptist. So we're going to start with um, Mark 6, um, Jesus is heading to Nazareth, so I'm going to read from verse 1. So he went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Joseph, and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offence at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honour except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Um, Every time I look at this chapter, I see something that I haven't put in my notes, which is really dangerous. And and one one of the things that makes me smile when I read that little section is when it says, Jesus could do no mighty work there except that. And I kind of think to myself, if we had that type of exception, we would be amazed, wouldn't we? You know, uh, only, could only heal a few sick people. Well, if we could see a few sick people healed, we would be astounded. Um, but that was considered to be not particularly productive. So this, this little passage tells us about Jesus' visit to his hometown of Nazareth. Um, he's speaking in the synagogue, um, and, and there's some things about these people that are listening that I find interesting or worth noting. Um, first thing is, do you notice how they question? How they raise questions? Um, What's, they're almost saying, how, how, how come he's doing this? How come he's doing this? Where did he learn? And there's some fascinating thoughts there. Because if you imagine, this is his hometown. This is where he grew up. This was his, effectively in our language, this was his home church. And you can imagine them sitting there going, Do you know what? 
We know our, we know our Bible teaching is not that good. So where did he learn that? Can you, can you imagine the sort of questions that are going around in their minds? Where did Jesus get this learning from? We know he never went to rabbinical school. We know he's a carpenter. We know he didn't go that training. Where has this knowledge come from? And how does he get, how does he go around doing these amazing things? How has he got this, suddenly got this ability to do this or to do that, to heal this person? And they're, they're asking these questions. They are questioning, but I'm not sure they're questioning it in a positive manner. They're kind of almost saying, whoa, who does he think he is? There's almost that element come, creeping in. Because they were familiar with Jesus. Because they, they list off his family. <laughs> yeah, They just list them all off, all the kids. Interesting, they, interesting Mark, Mark records him as Mary's son. That's, that's an interesting one. That was not common practice. Um, wonder why um, Mark, Mark records it that way. What, what, what was implied with that? Was it a bit of a slight? Or was it just the fact that Mary was there? Um, just an interesting question. Just an interesting thought. And, and then, their unbelief. He marveled, Jesus marveled at their unbelief. Um, it's almost like um, the stage was set almost before he started. That, um, you know, well, he's probably the most famous person that's ever, ever come out of Nazareth, so we better let him speak. <laughs> but I'm not sure they wanted to believe him. But I find it fascinating that, uh, again, as we was mentioned last session, that there's a connection between uh, faith and the miraculous works of Jesus. And, and it's just here again. You know, Jesus was not able to do much because of their unbelief. There's a little passage that I, I read describing this where it says Mark describes Jesus from the perspective of the people of Nazareth who know him as a carpenter and Mark relates Jesus' surprise that the people he knows from living in Nazareth reject him. That's an interesting thought isn't it? Jesus knows them and they know him and Jesus is surprised at them Here's, a, here's the thought. Familiarity with Jesus does not guarantee knowing who Jesus really is. As the secret of the kingdom God, of God is given to those who accept Jesus' words and deeds. We read that in chapter 4. Faith is, is, is what makes miracles possible. The faith... We, ha, get my words in, in a muddle here. Faith, which makes miracles possible, is God's gift to those willing to listen to and learn from Jesus. Jesus not, does not force himself on people, not even the people living in Nazareth. And there's this, this idea, this picture, that, which I, I really thought was quite good, quite interesting thought. Familiarity with Jesus does not mean that we really know who he is. And, and that, that just made me stop and think. And, and I'm, I'm going to have to move on. There's so much more I'd like to dig out of that passage, but um, we'll have to move on. But I want to just pause and just think for a minute. Um, what lessons are there from this little section for us? And the first lesson that I, I've noted is this. Um, we need to really be careful and be aware of the danger of thinking we know. Um, I don't know about you, but I mean, I mean, I know I've got the truth. Yeah, um, I, I know I understand. I mean, come on, I've, I've been to college, I've studied, I've read the books. Um, I know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and there's a real temptation for us as, God, as believers in Jesus to think, I, I know the truth. And if we're not careful, we, we can reject the views of other people um, the opinions of other people before weighing them up carefully. And, and one of the things that I've learned about Jesus, I don't know if you've learned this about him yet, 
but Jesus loves to challenge my um, assumptions. He loves to challenge my assumptions. If I assume this, I need to be really careful that Jesus is not going to come along and say, you, you can't put me in a box. You, you can't just confine me to, to this way of thinking. So we need to be careful. Another thing that I thought was interesting reflecting on this is, is, that, is this one. Uh, the effectiveness of ministry is not always about the minister. Jesus was good at what he did and he struggled with that crowd. They did not want to believe. And so what he could do and what he could achieve was limited. And it just reminds me that if even Jesus struggled at times, we need to acknowledge that um, you know, God gives people free will. And God has given everyone the freedom to reject him. And that, that's not an always an easy thing to accept. But ministry, the effectiveness of any ministry is not about always about the minister. It's much bigger than that. It's about what is God doing in the room? What is God doing through a life? What is God doing in the lives of everyone around? How, how, is, how is he working in the lives of, and the hearts of the, the people who are listening? There's so much happening um, that we don't necessarily see or understand. So two little thoughts. We need to be careful about we, what we think we know. And, and, and we need to remind ourselves that ministry is not always, um, the effectiveness of ministry is not always about the minister. It's not always about the person who's doing the ministry. It's often about what is happening in the lives of everyone else. Watching the clock needs to move on. Verse 7, Jesus um, sends out the 12. And, and Jesus calls the 12 and, and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. And if any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed uh, with oil many who were sick and healed them. Right at the beginning of this uh, little section, there's a, there's a sentence that immediately grabbed my attention. Um, and I think this is something we, we in our contemporary world um, do need to wrestle with and do need to, to explore, I would suggest. I'm not sure I've got time this evening to really delve into this in any detail. But my question is this, does Jesus give power or authority? And is the distinction important? There you go, that's a teaser for you to think about. Because it says here, he called them together, sent them out, and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. That, I would suggest that authority enabled them to exercise power. But I just throw it out as a thought. Yeah, I haven't got time to, to dwell on that one. So I'm just going to park that there. Leave that for you to think about and discuss and um, ask questions. So Jesus commissions the disciples to join him in announcing the kingdom of God. Yeah, that's, that's the commission. He commissions them to join him in announcing the kingdom in words and in deeds. They are to depend on God as they go, not take provisions, but to trust that God will be with them each step of the journey. And uh, just that one little paragraph in my thinking, I just want to go, I, I, I would love to just take the next half an hour and unpack that a bit. What does it mean um, to depend on God as we go? How, how does this 
picture for us what a life of faith looks like. That actually, in, in, when God calls you in, onto the journey of faith, because all of our lives is a journey of faith, and when God calls us to step on this journey and walk with him, I may not know what's coming uh, uh, down the road. I can't depend on my own resources. I've got to depend on Jesus. I can't, um, I can't plan and prepare for everything, so I have to just take whatever comes. You know, Jesus, Jesus says to them, if you, if you get somewhere and someone, someone offers you a room, take it. You know, don't, don't look, scout around and look for the best option in town. <laughs> take what's given to you. Don't, um, don't think you have to, to prepare and take provisions with you. God will provide for you along the way. And, and through our lives, um, as we journey with God through this life, how often when we encounter things, we're not prepared for what, we, what comes our way, but in the midst of what comes our way, God meets us and provides for us and cares for us. So much just in that little picture about the walk of discipleship that I think would, I would love to explore even further. Here's a couple of sentences that I read that really just, again, caught my attention. The commissioning meant that they were extensions of Christ. The sent one is as the man who commissioned him was the common belief. In other words, if I choose one of you and say, I want you to take a message from me to someone else, when you arrive at that place, you are standing in my place, representing me, and where you speak, I speak. Yeah? Now, I kind of want you to see the, the level of trust that's involved in that. The level of responsibility that's involved in that. And then I kind of just want to say, this is, is what Jesus was saying to these disciples. I am sending you out on my behalf to do this. Here's another thought. Followers of Jesus preached what Jesus preached and do what Jesus did. And I, I kind of just thought that was a wonderful little sentence. Followers of Jesus preach what Jesus preached and do what Jesus did. And you might go, yeah, makes perfect sense. Um, but I just, I want to kind of just think about it a bit more. Um, try and get under the, the surface level. Um, one of the things that struck me as I was working through this chapter is um, often we talk about, um, well, in, 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 the, in contemporary society, particularly in, in the Western church, we talk about, um, on, often contrast, preaching the gospel and living the gospel. And living the gospel, we normally mean things like being good people, feeding the poor, or feeding the hungry, caring for the poor, all that type of stuff. One of the things that really struck me as I was going through this chapter is Jesus told the disciples, yes, you must preach the gospel of repentance. That, and again, I think we, we need to, to really think about that word repentance. The word repentance was very powerful and meaningful for that in that context. I don't think it, it works the same in, in, in our world. What I think the word repentance, how we could rephrase it in our world is change your life. Change your allegiance. You've got to make a commitment to something different. We're calling people to a new uh, a way of living, a new lifestyle, a new way of existing. And the deeds, this is what really struck me, the deeds, the actions that demonstrate the kingdom was healing and deliverance, primarily. It was a spiritual display it wasn't really about caring for the poor or being good now don't misunderstand me that doesn't mean that you shouldn't care for the poor and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be good but it really struck me that actually mark is presenting to us a model of discipleship and following jesus that is I think subtly different from what we've accepted. We might preach what Jesus preached, but do we do what Jesus did? And, and that 
challenges me in so many different ways. Swiftly moving on. The minimum of provisions was meant to call out the maximum of faith. I like that. Um, and I'm sure Alan could talk lots about how that works out. That when you set out on a journey and you're trusting God for your provision every day, that actually I have not got any money in my pocket and actually I have not got any food to eat and it's getting to dinner time and I'm starting to feel hungry and you have to stop and say, please God, will you send me a meal? And that's where your dependence on God has to rise up. Your faith becomes dependence. Your faith becomes a, a confidence that the God who sent me here is the God who will provide for me here. Um, again, so much I'd love to just delve in and tinker around with that, but I haven't really got enough time. So I want to just, a lesson from that little section. Mark gives a clear picture that the mission and ministry of Jesus, which he invites his disciples to join, is one of teaching and demonstrating. The kingdom of God needs to be explained and demonstrated so people can see and understand what God is offering us in and through Christ. So this requires faith. Faith that what God says is true and that God will back up his truth with his action. I don't know if you've ever been in a situation, I can remember being in a situation where someone came to me and they said, I, I, Jeff, I want you to pray for me. And I said, right, okay. And they said, this is what my situation is. And I said, okay. And I prayed with that person and after I prayed with that person, I, I tried to sound confident. And I waited for them to go. And after they'd gone, I went somewhere quiet and I closed the door and I said, God, I hope you heard that because I, and I hope, I hope you're going to do something because that's way out of my, I have no idea how you could even possibly step into that situation. And you see, that's where faith, I don't have to see the answer, but I have faith that Jesus knows the answer. And even, if, even when I'm praying, I don't have to know what God is going to do. I just have to know that my God is a God who does things. Can you, can you see where I'm going? Faith. We have to have the faith that God will back up what he says. If we're to stand on God's word, then we have to believe that God will keep his word. And, and that's where the, the demonstrating bit kind of comes in. Because when it says... Um, at the end of the gospel, when we get to Mark 16, there's some corkers there, some wonderful things there about what we're meant to be doing, about healing the sick and all sorts of stuff. And, and I don't know about you, but if you've ever been asked to pray for a sick person um, who's really sick, it can be a bit intimidating if you don't know. If you don't know and you think, God, are you going to do something here? Um, so what, how, how do we pray in that situation? And we have to, if we're going to stand on God's word, we have to trust that God will back up his own word. That God will do what he says he will do. It's a bit like salvation. You see, we've got this one down. If someone comes forward and says, I want to be saved, I want to give my life to Jesus, we go, yay, great. And we stand with them, we pray for them, we say, yeah, here's what you do. You pray, you trust God, and you give it all to God, and you are now saved, aren't you? Yeah? And we know that, don't we? Yep. Yeah? We're sure of that, aren't we? Yep. It's about the only thing about following Christ we're sure of. The rest we question. Did Jesus really mean that if we, do, if we pray for the sick, they'd get healed? Did Jesus really mean if we do this, this will happen? And, and we can question a lot of this, but that is, I go back to that so often and say, so much, that is a perfect example of faith. That actually, when I pray, God does. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to know how, I just know he does. Need to move on. The next section is about the, 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 uh, the whole section is about John the Baptist. If you don't mind, I'm not going to read this whole section because I'm looking at the clock ticking on. And it's from verse 14, which starts uh, King Herod um, heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. 
And then there's a whole discussion about who do they think Jesus is. Um, and then it goes on to explain how um, Herod had arrested John the Baptist and put him in prison because he, he basically told him that he was breaking God's law. Um, and goes on to explain how um, Herod's um, had a, an event, a party, and um, his daughter came in and danced and he makes a promise and she goes back to her mum and her mum basically says ask for the head of John the Baptist so she does John gets beheaded and the disciples of John come and take his body and bury it now, Jesus is becoming well known he's no longer able to just if he ever was hide in a corner and it's that thought that Jesus has been so well known that even Herod has heard about Jesus. It's that thought that leads Mark off on this little detour about the death of John the Baptist. But this detour serves, I think, quite an important purpose. I want to go back again to, to the beginning of this series when um, we were looking at the... Alan was looking at the, the gospel, what, what it was about. And I don't know if you remember, he said that um, Mark was writing to the church in Rome at a time of persecution. A time of persecution. So through, through this, in this chapter, just in this chapter, as well as other places, Mark drops out little thoughts that, you know, remember... Um, Jesus faced rejection and discrimination and opposition. And, and we're called to follow Jesus, so if Jesus faced it, then we face it as well. It's part of the package of discipleship. And John the Baptist, likewise, faced Prison and death, even though he committed no crime. And, and I can, that kind of sparked a thought off in my head. You know, um, John, the forerunner of Jesus, the one who went before, prepared the way for Jesus. You know, we often think of it as his preaching and his message, but even in his life, John was arrested, actually declared innocent by the authorities, because Herod says he doesn't deserve to die. And yet he was executed because other people were trying to protect themselves. Herodias, Herod's wife, was protecting herself because John was challenging her marriage to Herod. And I can't help but think there's an interesting parallel there to Jesus. Uh, when we get to see that the... the, the the last week of Jesus' life, how he's, he's arrested, he's declared innocent, but actually he's executed because the Jewish leaders were more concerned about protecting themselves than doing what was right. And in all of this discussion about John and about what's happening with Jesus, Mark is underlying the fact that, um, again, this is a little quote, that missionary work is dangerous. And that discipleship is costly, both taking place in the context of admiration, opposition and rejection, and the real possibility of martyrdom. Now again, for us in this country, at this time, in this part of the world, all of that sounds a bit extreme, but at this point in history, in, in this year, most Christians in this world do not live in the West. And a significant proportion of the church, of followers of Jesus, the idea of um, opposition, rejection, persecution, and even martyrdom is not just theory. It's real. Very, very real. And just as those Christians in Rome needed the reminder 
that when they were facing the opposition and the persecution and the potential death, that actually they were just following in the footsteps of their master. And they were following in the footsteps of other believers. But this made me think about how, what, what's the lesson for us? Because that's prop, yeah, the idea of someone killing you for being a Christian is pretty extreme in this country. But it did raise a question for me. Jesus is, is following Jesus is potentially costly. So do we value Jesus enough to pay the price? That's my question. Do we value Jesus enough to pay the price? Like the parable of the man who found a, 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 was it a pearl or treasure hidden in a field? And he went and he sold everything so he could buy that field. And Jesus said, that, that's a picture of the kingdom of God. That actually, am I willing to let go of everything to have Jesus? Does Jesus mean that much to me? Do I value him that much? It's quite a challenge, isn't it? Interesting thought. Anyway, we've got to move on. I, I want to read this bit because I like this bit. Feeding of the 5,000. Um, just check the verse, number 30. The apostles returned to Jesus. And, and, and we've, do you notice we've, we've jumped back again now to... Jesus sent, the, sent them out. They went and did this amazing stuff and then they come back. The apostles return to Jesus. Um, interesting, they're called apostles now. It's just a little throwaway thought. Um, and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Um, a lovely thought about that phrase, desolate place. Um, a wilderness, a quiet place, a remote place. You could the desert you could interpret it all sorts of different ways for many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves now many saw them going and recognized them and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them and when he went ashore he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd and he began to teach them many things and when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, well, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven. And he said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Wow, what a story. The disciples were reporting back to Jesus. And Jesus recognised they had been busy, that they were tired, and they needed some downtime. And he basically says to them, you need a break. As one commentator said, they did not even have time for a snack. I think that's a very loose translation of that verse. And I want to just hit the pause button here. And I want to throw out a, a question and a challenge. And I'm looking at everyone in this room and I'm probably thinking, you guys are probably not the people that need to hear this challenge. Might be, but I suspect probably not. I keep being told life's different now. And I just want to say, really? They were struggling to cram in time for a meal. Doesn't that sound familiar?
I really believe we must be careful not to use busyness as a reason to not be involved in serving Jesus. It goes back to what we're thinking before. Discipleship is costly. There is a price to pay. But actually, the price is worth it. And I want to flip back and move on a bit. Um, and I want to ask you, did you notice Jesus' compassion for the people? He, as soon as he saw the crowds, you know, he's with the disciples. His first concern was for the disciples. They need rest. And they got them somewhere. And he's looking at the disciples and he looks at the crowd and he goes, oh, my heart breaks for them. Here's a thought for you. Again, a little quote. His compassion is prompted by the people's need to hear and understand the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God and the need for repentance and faith. And we live in, in, a, in, in a, a time when actually um, I'm being told to have compassion for the person who is hungry. At the moment it's free school meals. We should have compassion. We should care for those who need food. We have food bank. We should have compassion for these people who are struggling. We're told that actually at the moment there's a huge brewing mental health crisis. As people of compassion, we should care about that. But the thing that strikes me about this time was Jesus did not, in his heart, go to that point first. His compassion drew him to a spiritual need. They needed a shepherd. This was their primary need. And I honestly, honestly believe in my heart there's something here for us to grapple with and grasp. That actually, when we put people's spiritual needs first, often some of the other stuff falls into place. In Matthew put it, didn't he? Seek first the kingdom of God and these other things will be added to you. And I wonder, when was the last time you looked at someone and your heart broke in compassion because they were lost and needed a shepherd? Interesting thought. And then after teaching them and all the rest, that then comes the need for food. And Jesus asked his disciples to meet the need, um, which again just intrigues me. Was it a test? Did Jesus have a plan all along? Um, was he just, I don't know, exploring an idea with them? I mean, did he really think that they were going to go out and buy food? And the disciples are, are struck by the enormity of what Jesus asks them and their limitations and inadequacies. And again, a little quote for you. It's good to understand our limitations and weaknesses because then there can be no mistake as to where the power comes from. That when we, when we recognise that I of myself have no way of meeting this need, and I turn to God and he meets the need, I can't claim it as my own, can I? I can't claim credit for it, because God's done it. And it's been utterly clear that God has done it. And I, I, I would love to pause at this point and talk about... Um, the exodus imagery that's in the feeding of the 5,000. They're in a desert. They get provided bread by God. So, so many things. Anyway, I haven't got time. Also, fascinating, when, when Jesus um, then prepares this meal, I, this one little thought just really caught me out. He takes the bread blesses it and distributes it just as the head of any family would at a meal. 
I thought, that's an interesting thought. Just as the head of the father in the family at home would, would, would take the, the bread and, and pray a blessing over it, this was the Jewish custom, and then the family would take of it and eat. I was thinking, isn't there an interesting parallel thought there about Jesus as the head of the church? There's also some wonderful little think, think thoughts around the whole idea of, um, is Mark trying to say something to us here about communion? When we break bread, that God feeds us and nourishes us? Anyway, loves, lovely things to explore, no time. But, so, some little lessons for us to note from this one. I honestly believe that serving Jesus will always put demands on our time and energy. We may need some downtime, but must not let this cause us to step back from wholeheartedly following after Jesus. And we need to let God's compassion for people's spiritual need of the Good Shepherd to really get us. I think we need to learn to enjoy being out of our depth. Because that where, that's where Jesus does his most amazing work. Moving on to walking on water. <laughs> From one thing to the next, it's just incredible, isn't it? So, it goes on immediately. He made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he dismissed the crowd. And after he had taken leave of them, he went up on the mountain to pray. And when evening came, the boat was out on the sea, and he was alone on the land. And he saw that they were making headway painfully, for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by, but when they saw him walking on the sea, they thought it was a ghost and cried out, for they all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And he got into the boat with them, and the wind ceased, and they were utterly astounded, for they did not understand about the loaves, but their hearts were hardened. Again, oh, so much we could explore here. So, Jesus sends off the disciples, says, right, get on with you. Go away. And then he goes up a mountain or a hill to pray. And this reveals an important lesson for us. Jesus' relationship with the Father was close and intimate because he took the time to be alone with the Father. Public ministry flows from private intimacy if we want God to be seen in us and through us by others we must take the time to grow our inner life with God through devotion worship thanksgiving and praise and I just reminded me that um, you know, you know, elsewhere didn't it Jesus said you, you free, freely if you've, you've received so freely give if you've not received, how are you going to give? You can receive freely, but if, if you haven't received, how are you going to give? Um, it also reminded me um, of the little book, The Divine Mentor, which I hope some of us have read. Um, the chapter uh, at the beginning of that book about feeding yourself and, and how um, you know, Wayne Cordero says, look, look um, if, if, you are, if you're trying to live, spiritually live off of Sundays, you've got a problem. Because actually, if, if, if you were telling me that physically you only ate a meal on a Sunday, I'd be saying to you, what? Why? And, and if, if you were saying, you know, that, well, I've got, I've got food in my cupboard and you still weren't eating, I'd, I'd be going, you're crazy. We have spiritual food. We have our Bibles. We have access to the Father through prayer. If we don't feed ourselves, we're going to be weak and skinny and not be able to do a lot. 
because we won't be healthy. Jesus understood this, which is why he took time out and he got away. And it was just him and God. One of the commentators said this, which really intrigued me about this little passage as well. He said, the episode is best understood as a theophany. Um, if you don't know what a theophy, theophany is, it's when God reveals himself. Um, Jesus reveals his divine presence. And at the same time, Mark reminds his readers that the 12 still do not truly understand who Jesus is, despite the fact that they have witnessed Jesus' Jesus's demonstration of divine authority. I think it's, it's again this messianic secret, which we've talked about, which weaves its way through Mark's gospel. The, you know, the disciples, Jesus is, is revealing who he is. Jesus is unraveling himself before them. For this revelation that he's given to them. And they're sitting there scratching their head saying, I'm not quite sure what he's trying to say. Uh, they just don't quite get it. But it reminds me. And again, I'm, I mustn't go off script too much. Um, without the Spirit of God, it is very hard for us to understand God. And, and I think we need to acknowledge that because too often we expect other people to understand God when they've, they've not encountered him. They don't, they, uh, they've not, the Spirit hasn't touched their life yet in that manner, so they won't understand. To them, they're scratching their head going, what, you are? I don't get it. That comes a bit later. This is a theophany in that, that Jesus reveals his divinity. And there's a couple of things here which is, which is quite interesting. Um, here's a thought. In Job chapter 9, we read that it is God who stretches out the heavens and treads on the waves of the sea. That's a thought, isn't it? And, and throughout the Old Testament, God reveals himself, or a revelation of God, is often comes as God passes by. Now Jesus was passing by the boat. So for Moses in Exodus 33, up the mountain, and God passes by, causes his glory to pass by. Or Elijah, very similar thing, in, in, in the rock, and God passed by. And even with all this revelation going on, the disciples are struggling to understand. And it's been noted that the disciples should have moved beyond the stage of instinctive astonishment to one of understanding who Jesus is. They're still sitting there, astounded, going, who is this guy? The penny hasn't quite dropped yet. Is that what Mark meant about the loaves? They did not understand about the loaves. Because that's the previous thing. They should have understood. If someone can feed a massive crowd from five, lo five loaves of bread... <laughs> that, that, that's, that's, what does that say about who they are? And if they haven't understood that, they didn't, is that why they didn't understand what was going on when Jesus came to them on the water? Some lessons for us from that. The importance of cultivating a private walk with God. Massive. Um, just go back to the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel and read how, how often, uh, I think it's, it's Matthew 6 particularly, um, what God sees in the secret place, in the private place. Go, go and look up those phrases, fascinating. We need to have a daily, regular life with God. Um, 
then also the importance of taking in and understanding the revelation that we're already being given about Jesus. If we don't take on board what God has already shown us about Jesus, how will we build on that when he reveals something new? I'm looking at the clock and I know we've got no time left. Last little section, which I won't read. I'll leave you to read that for yourself. Jesus heals the sick in Gennesaret. He crosses over, comes to the land, uh, tie up the boat. People come out. Um, he begins to heal them. And they say, can we just, can we let, will you let us just touch your cloak, your gar, the fringe of your garment? Um, again, we're back to this Jesus healing many people. Again, little thought for you. Again, this is uh, uh, something I read. In chapter 3, people touch Jesus. In chapter 5, the woman touches Jesus' garment. And the people here touch the fringe of his garment. I don't know if there's any relevance to that at all, but it's interesting, isn't it? But the fact that the people implored him that they might touch even the fringe of his, they asked, can we just touch? Implies faith. Which brings us back to where we started from. The connection between faith and the miracle. So my short lesson to learn from that one touch from Jesus can change everything. We are invited to believe and have faith and to reach out to Jesus, expecting him to change us, heal us, deliver us. So, in conclusion, how do you bring all of those thoughts together from one chapter? Um, well, Jesus reveals uh, proclaims and demonstrates the kingdom of God to us. And we're invited to believe, to have faith, not just for ourselves, but to join Jesus in the proclaiming and the demonstrating of the kingdom to those around us. The mission is costly. It will demand our time, our energy, and may well bring opposition and even suffering. But Jesus can provide for us because he's God and he is able.